So the basic system is that there's a lot of these, you know, Eurasian, authoritarian inclined states that have that are usually either in control of hard natural resources or dominant or dominant global production, which means they, they accumulate massive amounts of surpluses. So those surpluses are mainly dollars. And then the balance of payments in the global system have to be balanced by net deficits. So as they accumulate ever larger surpluses, the West has to accumulate ever larger deficits. And so UK and India and um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of Europe, especially Southern Europe and, uh, and the US have to run massive deficits. That's why we're running, you know, historically large deficits. Um, we have to, this is the balance of payments. The system as it sort of worked uh, is that those, those surpluses have to get recycled into our assets. So, you know, we sell off basically our equities, our sports teams, our real estate, um, you know, our like anything that's like desirable that, that these um, foreign reserve managers want to buy, they buy it. And so like it has really distorted our economy, right? Because it means that, uh, a large portion of our economy for the past, you know, 50 years, really in the past 20 some years after China came into in, uh, WTO and it was accelerated or turbocharged this recycling system, is that like the sectors of our economy that benefited from that were like the fire sectors. So finance, insurance, real estate, the parts of our, our, of our economy that were basically designed to take these global capital flows from China, from Saudi Arabia, from Russia, and funnel them into their economies, like funnel them into you know, fancy Knightsbridge real estate in, in London, right? Mm -hmm. Funnel them into wealth management products in, in you know, from, from JP Morgan or, 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 um, or Goldman Sachs. Fund them into, uh, you know, our tech firms, right? Why Saudi is like a major equity holder, or was an equity holder and still has, a, I think, a position in the capital stack in, uh, in Twitter. Um, so there's like, there's a reason why these, these and these, uh, like the GCC in China and Russia have like oligarchs and a lot of like, uh, equity investment and control over like, Western firms. And this has actually created a lot of national security concerns inside the intelligence community because these are uh, very often used as mechanisms for influence campaigns um, that the Chinese are really good at, right? In terms of like co-opting Western elites to, you know, defang elite, uh, you know, what will always be like elite resistance to the rise of a competitor power. If you're getting rich off of them, maybe you're okay with that, right? Case in point, Ray Dalio, Bridgewater, right? Who his firm manages like Chinese state assets. Okay, like this is what you would expect. Like this is this is you're not, not going to be people that are going to be for breaking the system. Um, and here's my new book. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is the this is the challenge we're in though, and this doesn't mean like they have everyone checkmated because China domestically has its own major economic issues, right? They have to. They have massive overinvestment in their um, industrial capacity that they've tried to export, you know, demand to BRI, right? So they take dollars from their surpluses and they basically do dollar lending to- BRI, Af Brazil, the, Russia, India? Uh, the Belt and no. Road Initiative. Oh, sorry. This is the major geoeconomic- yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, I know. Of, yeah, so they have, you know, lent, you know, or mostly, yeah, lent about trillion dollars to uh, African countries, South, South American countries, even across Eurasia, um, even to, like Montenegro, like they have like a bridge that they still owe. That's like the, the debt payments on that bridge is like something like 12% of their GDP. It's like the same thing. <laughs> or a fucking uh, bridge, really? Yeah, it's, it was a big scandal. Um, or Sri Lanka, like there's a row that costs like $40 million a kilometer. Um, big, big, big scandals here. Um, but yeah, so they've used the dollar system that they accumulate these dollar surpluses and they weaponize it by you know, embarking on this program of strategic influence. Um, and they had a really clever arrangement where not just like ports, but often like resource projects, like offshore drilling or mines or whatever. And they collateralize the loan with the revenues. And so they take the revenues from those projects and they park them into two funds that they manage offshore. One is to repay the loan. It's like the, the stream of you know, interest payments essentially. And the other is like, is, is essentially the, the profit from that, that project goes into an offshore fund that the Chinese control, the Chinese uh, state owned enterprise usually controls. And it's, it's, like the, it's like the collateral that if you default on the loan, you know, weak frontier market, we'll just take all this. Like what would otherwise be your profit from this whole project, we'll just take it instead. Um, and that's how they've collateralized a lot of these BRI loans. Um, and it's usually people say the BRIs have blown back in SOE's faces because, and that is like for some of these projects they have blown up, but not all of those flows are accounted for. <laughs> a lot of this is in offshore money centers. They're, they're, they're going back to the Chinese in other ways. Um, and so yeah, this has become 
one of the major critiques I have of uh, you know the the current uh, you know like the net net is the global dollar system good for the United States, right? It's like, well, it's generated a whole bunch of these political pathologies where we've deindustrialized the Midwest, created a lot of, of you know, political frictions as a result to the relative advantage of you know, economic sectors that maybe aren't all that net productive or innovative, like the finance, insurance, real estate sectors. Um, and it has become a major mechanism by which our adversaries, especially these um, Eurasian autocrats can buy up our, our most valuable assets and also spread strategic influence throughout um, uh, the Eurasian periphery in their attempt to, you know, get those countries on their side. Like there's a statistic that for every 10% um, more that a typical or an average African country votes in alignment with China at the UN General Assembly, they could expect to see 86% more Chinese BRI funding. So there's a clear like geoeconomic link between uh, BRI and you know strategic influence in in these in these uh, in these in these in, in these parts of the world where we are trying to compete um, and Africa is one of those places where like all the raw material all the raw materials for the <laughs> future of the uh, the energy transition are going to be coming out of these countries and China has a like one of their top priorities is to dominate um, the renewable uh, uh, you know energy uh, industry just like you know Saudi Arabia dominates um, oil. Uh, and so they are trying to lock up a lot of these, you know, uh, critical inputs to solar power manufacture, battery, uh, battery production, and they want to locate the futures markets for those commodities in China, uh, unlike where the, right now the, the futures markets for most commodities are in the United States. Yeah, I listened to the Rogan show with a guy who talked about the cobalt mining mm -hmm. in um, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Did you hear it? Uh, I saw the clips and yeah, I followed the story. Yeah. I mean, it's well worth a listen yeah. to, but he talks about large a large majority of those mines are owned by Chinese companies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, in fact, uh, I think there was an American company that used to own it. And, you know, there was such a, you know, moral and like public backlash or sort of, you know, uh, dissuasion against being involved in that, that they, they divested and the Chinese said, okay, we'll take it. Yeah. We don't um, give a fuck. They, yeah. They don't care. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. These, uh, the SOEs have been sort of given free reign by the, by the Chinese government to, you know, just go out there and make a buck. Um, and so, yeah, they don't have as much moral compulsion, environmental compulsion uh, as Western firms do. Uh, Human yeah. rights compulsion. No, no, by no means. Um, yeah, and actually one of the interesting challenges recently has been one of the critiques about, okay, China's got all this BRI funding, but they don't have the military capability to back it up, right? So, okay, they have these loans, but they don't have the fifth fleet. They don't have aircraft carriers that can, you know, have a you know blue water, you know cross continental power projection capability, um, and actually what China is really innovating on in a lot of these countries is uh, you don't need those types of military capabilities to really enforce these hard these natural resource claims. What you need are um, proxy uh, allies that you can get on your board, as well as private military companies. So PMCs is what they're called. And so China has really invested a lot in like their equivalent to like the Wagner Group, although they're not as bloodthirsty psychopaths like, like the Wagner group is from Russia. Um, but they're like professional mercenaries, right? They're not official, you know, Chinese military officers. Um, they are private. They're like Blackwater, basically. In fact, Blackwater contracted with Chinese government. Uh, well, it wasn't Blackwater, but it was Eric Prince's other company, um, Frontier Resources Group in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Africa to do some of this stuff. Um, so they're actually able to effectively project military power where it's needed in an asymmetric way. Um, the U.S. government has... You know, a lot of special operations capability in Africa to try to do something similar, um, you know, where we have host government agreements to, you know, you know do counterterrorism missions that happen to be near strategic resources. Uh, but this is, I think, a, some of the canards that are, pl you know, played around to sort of um, be skeptical of China's ability to enforce these geoeconomic um, patterns of, of, of influence because they don't have, you know, 11 aircraft carriers. And it's true, they don't have those, but I think they yeah. don't need those necessarily. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, well, and they're building them quickly. They're building them, yeah. They have, and this is a, you know. Didn't they just launch one recently? They have the Liaoniang, uh, which is their major flagship aircraft carrier. I think they're building another one. Uh, and they got a, one more on the way after that. Yeah, their ship building capacity is, is enormous. Um, they have by far the largest ship building capacity in the world, uh, mostly for commercial shipping, but it's, you know, that infrastructure is used for, uh, you know, like, you know, naval buildup. And they've embarked on the largest military modernization in, in history. You know, like 
the U.S. government typically isn't histrionic when it comes to doing these sorts of assessments. But if you read, you know, statements of, of like, you know, the deputy, uh, uh, like different deputy assistant secretaries for like strategy force planning from the Pentagon, like they'll, they'll come out with pretty, pretty like uh, strong statements assessing how quickly China's uh, capabilities have improved and how concerned they are about the deterrence capabilities of the United States relative to to what China's been able to do um, across lots of different domains. And, you know, a lot of my day job is also related to like cyber security. And so cyber is a major domain that stretches not just like the commercial environment, but obviously the strategic environment and space. Space is becoming like a, a, a cr critical domain of, of competition. And China is a major space player, like very big in space. Um, so yeah, there's, a, you know, I, I'm not like a China bull, right? but I think they have a lot of demographic issues. Their political system isn't all that innovative. They've got a strong man leader um, who doesn't necessarily listen to his advisors on things. Uh, they have a lot of problems. They've got, you know, these massive debt loads. So, but I think people that, you know, underestimate, you know, r rising um, uh, aspirant uh, revengeous powers, you know, history tells you that you, know, you should keep an eye out. You mapped out a scenario or scenarios uh, in your article. Can mm -hmm. you talk me through that? Certainly. So there's been some, a lot of like, um, you know, hot topic in the like geoeconomic uh, monetary discussion. A lot of it's precipitated by a certain analyst named Zoltan Poznar from Credit Suisse, who's you know, written a number of these um, kind of notes articulating what he calls kind of Bretton Woods three thesis, which he sort of updated and refined and just in the past you know, a few uh, weeks, he's sort of released sort of different versions of it. Um, it's quite complicated, so I don't want to go through all of it, but, yeah. but the basic premise is, um, is what we sort of were talking about before, which is, can China create um, a uh, economic arrangement that gives them some of the similar benefits that the U.S. has? Like, that's their, like, overall objective, if you think, like, longer term, is they want to have their own sphere of influence that you know, eliminates all of their dependence uh, and, uh, you know, removes any potential coercive power the United States has over them. So that's like the high level objective so that the CCP can endure indefinitely and they can have the great, you know, rejuvenation of the Chinese people, achieve the great Chinese dream and, you know, resolve the, the Taiwan question in our generation. These are like the major commitments that they've made to the public. So these are like the high level strategic objectives. Those translate to having a regional balance of power arrangement that's in their favor. That includes also bilateral trade arrangements, uh, trade agreements, and an and economic and monetary arrangement that is not subject to U.S. influence or control. That's like that's like the high-level strategic objective. Now, how they get there is like the is like the key question, right? And can they get there? And what's the pathway that they'll try to get to that point? And I think, you know, for me, I think they have a, an approach. You know, it's it's quite complicated. But in my sort of simple fish brain, it's like first starting with um, uh, building up some of the like alternative infrastructure in like, as like the in case, right? So right now they mostly use Swift, just like everyone else does. Um, right now they, you know, engage heavily in the global dollar clearing system with Western banks. You know, they're intimately connected into the global euro dollar system. They have, you know, over a trillion dollars in US treasury securities. So they haven't like decided to do that break yet, right? <laughs> um, so they're not like, they haven't gone really that far down that road yet. But what they have done is built up some of these alternative infrastructures so that they have like the systems in place in like proto form, one to like maybe gradually uh, grow and mature over time or as like a backup plan in case they get locked out. And so this, you know, two big ones really are, you know, DCEP, the digital currency electronic payment, like the digital, like that's basically the, the technology package for the digital yuan that they're trying to export along BRI, but they're sort of testing it in different countries and setting it up more in like these prototype stages. Uh, including domestically, they like really launched it officially um, at the the Winter Olympics. So it's still very early in in its sort of development. And then it's SIPs, the sort of cross border interbank uh, settlement system. They're really trying to build their own terms to basically Fedwire and Swift. That's like first one. So the their strategy is really just like block, then build, and then expand. So that's like across lots of domains. It's been their strategy. Like in the South China Sea, it's been the same strategy. It's like First, like invest in denial weapons so that like they can block U.S. military from like doing too much in their immediate proximity. And then they want to build. They want to build the islands physically. They actually built you know islands in the South China Sea. Um, and then they want to expand. They want to like uh, you know eventually they want to you know push us out. They want to push. They want to reset the balance of power in 
uh, in, the, in the South China Seas. They want to do that, I think, similarly in the economic domain, um, but it takes a lot of time. So they want to they want to block first uh, and just like protect themselves. They want to build these infrastructures and then they want to expand them. And that's how they get to that expansion stage. There's a lot of debate right now, and it's for me it's a little bit more speculative. Um, but you can see things happening with these arrangements with the GCC, with Saudi Arabia, with Russia, for example, like over 50% of the bilateral trade between Russia and China um, is in Yuan, when it was like, I don't know, 10% before the war. So like dramatically shifted to the point where that's basically completely de-dollarized. So all these arrangements, you know, any individual piece you can be kind of skeptical of, right? How much oil trade is gonna be settled in Yuan, uh, in the rupee, in the ruble, and it's probably not going to make much of a difference in the near term. But I think they're trying to like put in place the infrastructure, the bilateral like political agreements first, and then once the political agreements uh, uh, are in place, you know they can then co coerce or influence major institutional players to make those shifts because they're not going to happen organically in a market. <laughs> like like no one's going to market demand the yuan, right? <laughs> right? But. If most sovereign wealth funds and major institutional players are basically coerced because access to the Chinese market, access to you know, critical commodities is like kind of geopolitically contingent, that's that's going to be the major pivot point, right? Is when people don't you know voluntarily really adopt the yuan, but if you know you want to keep selling to us, or you want to keep uh, you know, trading with us, you have to use the DCEP. You have to basically agree to settle with us. Um, that could be the thing that shifts the balance, and that's where we're not there yet. And they haven't pulled that card because they know that card will be likely like the point at which they're going to be um, challenged by the United States and across all, all, a lot of other domains. Like these aren't going to happen in a vacuum. There's going to be like the United States is not just going to take this lying down, right? Yeah, we're course. not just going to like let this happen. We're going to do lots of things, you know, to, to contest this. Um, and that those that's going to be a very messy um, dynamic. That's really what we're going to see take place in the next, you know three to five years, I think. It all feels a little bit like this, like, how much can I push you? How much, just like test a bit more, test a bit more. Yeah, I mean, China has been very um, sophisticated in how they think about, I mean, it's like literally like the, the famous uh, slogan from Deng Xiaoping was, uh, hide your strength, bide your time, right? And which is like, it's kind of a clue, right? It's like, what are you biding your time for? Why are you hiding your strength, right? Like the idea was their weak power uh, when they, you know, first, you know, kind of shed, shed, shed Mao. And they had to, you know, embark on this program of global integration. But they knew that that created lots of risks, especially after a post-Soviet collapse to their system of government and their personal, their personal safety and their livelihoods. And so they had a very, um, you know, they had, they had to think uh, strategically. There's a, there's a book called The Long Game by Rush Doshi, who's actually currently the director for China Policy on the National Security Council, and his PhD thesis turned into this book, is like a systematic analysis of Chinese government documents to try to unpack and make a case that uh, they actually have a grand strategy. And most countries don't have a grand strategy. And his closest analogy would be like Bismarck's Germany. And a grand strategy is where countries, um, all the instruments of national power and bureaucratic um, plans and agency um, resources are pretty effectively aligned over a long period of time to achieve like a high level national strategic objective. And that is usually most countries don't have that, right? Most countries are just like, what's our next year's budget? This is our planning documents. We want to have, you know, you know, new investments in X, Y, or Z. But uh, he makes it case like China has this pretty clear grand strategy to, um, to grow into a, to, a, to a global power. And this translates into a lot of different activities across multiple domains. Um, but one of those critical domains was in like strategic influence. This has been very underplayed and still is a kind of underplayed. The, the degree to which China's be really effective at conducting um, kind of sub-threshold gray zone activities as well as like influence operations in the West. And that's mainly been conducted in the West by the Ministry of State Security, which is their equivalent to the CIA. Um, and this started really in the 80s. And there's a book called Spies and Lies by a researcher from um, uh, Australia named um, Alex Josky. And he really like unpacked how like China was really sophisticated at using these front organizations for cultural exchange, trade exchange, and a lot of like Westerners that wanted to do business in China would go through these sort of uh, sort of middlemen, right? Like we can get you the meetings with the local provincial official, et cetera, but you come through me and we'll help you basically, um, you know, get get that business. And they were all intelligence officers basically, and so they're not doing the traditional work of spying, which is like 
I recruit you as an asset inside you know, the government and you give me the secret documents and you know, on, on the, in, the, in the fake rock, right, kind of thing. It was just like developing friendships, developing relationships, um, nurturing you know, upstart political uh, aspirants you know, in like, local councils before they become major political officials. Like, they had a very sophisticated long-term view of how to develop these relationships over time and really strategically influence our political conversation, our, our economic conversation to basically, and one of the like, critical um, priorities for the MSS, like starting in the 90s was like convince the West that China getting rich is good. <laughs> convince the West that, op that, that us uh, climbing the ladder of technology and getting richer and getting more powerful is good. And this was like believed, right? We actually thought that we could convert them to the liberal order. And this was like, this was an influence operation. This was like, this was a psychological operation to convince us that this would happen, that, that they would democratize as they got wealthy and they would, you know, liberalize their political system. They would do these experiments in local elections, et cetera. And it was all basically um, confection. It was, it was a way to kind of, um, and we were willing to believe that because we just wanted to make a lot of money, right? <laughs> um, and now we're waking up belatedly to the fact that, you know, they have no intention of liberalizing as a, as a, as a as a, as, a, as a ruling state. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's the major recognition that, that it has occurred gradually. And then now is, you know, is, has definitely solidified in the major political um, and, you know, kind of policy circles in, in, in the West, especially the United States. And now it's translating into these actions, right? Like total economic war, <laughs> essentially just try to halt China's technological advancement, um, you know, massive pressure campaigns, like really trying to, uh, you know, take on, China as a, as a major sort of pacing threat to, to the United States.